Molt bona tarda a tothom. A very good afternoon to everyone. The Service for Education and New Opportunities has the honor today of introducing Professor Carlos Moreno of Big Picture Learning, a, a network of schools, not only in the United States, but also in Italy and Netherlands. Thank you very much, Professor Carlos Moreno, for agreeing to our invitation. It's a pleasure to see so many teachers logging in from so many different uh, stages in schooling. Uh, we have a large number of people signed in and uh, at, we'll tell you the numbers at the end. Everybody's here with great enthusiasm. We first learned about big picture learning based on a report on uh, uh, schools at the human scale by Tom's Ber Tom Beresford. This is a document we will be sharing with you in the chat because it's very enlightening. It's a document that discusses big picture learning and other kinds of schools that try to take on the challenge of scaling up a student-centered approach based on the idea of uh, spreading new cultures in education. This document warns us that if we don't commit, if we don't all commit to scale up this student-centered approach, then educational reform will be nothing but yet another source of inequality rather than achieving an impact at scale, because it really needs to be for everyone. Carlos has experienced the consequences of inequality in the first person and how our neighborhood and our family background are the chief predictor of success according to many reports published by international researchers and this is also something that we teachers experience on a day-to-day -day basis in our classrooms this challenge is too complex to tackle on one's own we all need to come come in you know textbooks teachers students uh, politicians everybody we need to make sure that our policies are designed that that our schools are designed deliberately to afford something that is centered on all students education is a struggle that can only be done collectively a successful system is a system that provides the right conditions for every single student to flourish as, much, flourish as much as possible. Carlos Moreno has understood this better than anyone, and he devotes his life's work to ensuring that all students, especially the ones that haven't fit in well to in traditional schools, uh, achieve success. In our group called Learning in the School that Learns, we, have, we share this perspective of trying to place students at the center of learning. A few months ago, Professor Andy Hargreaves was with us for a couple of, ben, uh, of webinars. He referred to his book, Well-Being in Schools, and said that uh, academic success, for academic success, well-being is essential and vice versa. You can't have well-being without success or success without well-being. This is something that's implemented in big picture schools. Respect for individual learners is also combined with rigor and excellence. And that's mutual, school, uh, students to the school and to the school to students. Thank you very much, Carlos Moreno, for being here with us today and sharing your big picture learning experience. We will I will now leave you with Mireya Shurto, the coordinator of the Learning in the School that Learns group, who will describe what participation will be looking like in this webinar. Thank you very much. Mireya, over to you. Thank you very much. This is the fifth webinar organized by our working group. We had Catherine Riley in a workshop format, and then we had Andy Hargreaves in a virtual panel discussion. Today's format is a lecture. You will see Carlos Moreno sharing parts of conversations, uh, a conversation between a pic big picture learning student and a uh, uh, student, uh, Maria Rosorio from one of our schools. We would like to thank you for making this happen. 
uh, we're very grateful for your presence. We're, we believe that your voices here today will make a huge difference. We would like to encourage all participants to ask questions and whatever here on YouTube, and we will be passing them on to the speaker so he can answer them at the end of his lecture. We would also point out that you can also listen to the uh, lecture directly in English using a different link we will be sending you through the chat. In any case, Professor, welcome. Welcome to Catalonia, even if it's only virtually. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, th thank you so much, Mireya, and thank you, Begonia, for that incredibly thoughtful introduction. Es un orgullo estar aquí con ustedes hoy, and I am tremendously honored to, to be here with you all. Um, and thank you for everyone that's watching for allowing me to be in community with you this afternoon for you, morning for me. Um, I have deep appreciation, especially during this COVID period, for technology platforms because to state a little bit of the obvious, we live in very different places. Uh, I live in New Jersey uh, and you all live from my understanding in the Catalonia region of Spain. So to a great extent, most of our respective destinies have been predetermined by the country we're born in. So let's consider for instance, how different our life experiences would be today by the mere fact what if we would have been born in Ukraine and not the United States or Spain? Uh, it's always challenging for me to go into my talks and conversations without acknowledging all that is going on around us in the world. And I recognize that the impact of the conflict in Ukraine is or will affect you all very differently than it will us here in the US. So I would just like to take a moment of just to honor and respect our Ukrainian brothers and sisters who, especially those who are no longer with us, those who have been displaced and have been relocating because they have no other choice, and those who have chosen to stay back and defend their beloved country. We can just take a moment to just pay our respects. Thank you all for that. Um, some might argue that demography uh, just equals destiny. And in other words, that where we live has a tremendous impact in how we will grow up and what our level of success as adults will be. Now, I have stood on stages, sometimes in front of thousands of people and have made the counter argument. I've said loudly and boldly and proudly that Demography does not equal destiny. And partly because I want to believe this, but also because that's what people want to hear. We all want that hope. They want to hear that particularly as educators, our ability to reach young people and inspire them to rise above the impact of geography can and should be profound. And when I say it in front of a room of thousands of people using large bold letters, they take pictures of it, they share it on social media, they amplify these words. But let me start with an acknowledgement that I may be taking for granted. And that is that you know where I'm, come, where I'm from. So I'll slow down a bit and share that I'm from a town in New Jersey called Montclair, which will be important in just a minute. And by way of settling context, I'm gonna assume that many of you all know about New York City which is represented by the icon on this image. Montclair is less than a 30 minute drive to New York City. And if you're from this area, it's pretty well known that Montclair has a reputation for being a pretty affluent town. But like any town or city in the United States, it's made up of neighborhoods of varying demographic status, people of different races, ethnicities, and economic status. So I'd like to focus now a little bit on the neighborhood around Upper Mountain Avenue, which is highlighted here in red. And it's not in red because I wanna point it out. It's in red because the data shows that if you grow up poor and black in this neighborhood, 
by the time you're 35 years old, you'll still be poor and you'll still be black. And this is despite the high economics of this town that I live in. And even if we make the parents of these future adults middle income, young black people still fall behind in comparison to their peers in the surrounding neighborhoods in my town. And it remains true for high, high income black Americans. Evidence and data suggest that growing up in the neighborhood surrounding Upper Mountain Avenue very much determines your destiny. So I, I have chosen Montclair because I live here, because I know how to talk about it. And primarily because it's very real to me. But this data, which I've pulled from a wonderful source that we have here in the States called the Opportunity Atlas, reveals that this is true, particularly for black and brown colored communities all across the country. And quoting directly from an article in the New York Times recently, it states, extensive data shows the punishing reach of racism for black boys. It also reads that black boys raised in America, even in the wealthiest families and living in some of the most well-to-do neighborhoods, still earn less in adulthood than white boys with similar backgrounds. And according to this study that traced the lives of millions of children. Now the, this video takes only two minutes to redistribute the fates of over 10,000 boys who grew up rich in families. And that it will show at the end is that only 17% of the young black men who grew up rich will remain rich. And over 21% of those same young men will actually end up as poor adults. So for, for many of these men, their demographies, even though they're rich and wealthy, combined with opportunity or lack of opportunity will equal their destiny. Now you're probably thinking, I did not come here to be depressed or no vine aquí para estar deprimido or deprimida. So here's what I'll share with you and what we've learned from our work at Big Picture Learning. In order to better understand that demography does not equal destiny, you have to understand that country of origin, region or state, or even neighborhood still doesn't zoom in closely enough. Now that may sound counterintuitive, but in order to see the bigger picture, you need to zoom in, not out. I'd like to quote my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Susan Enfield, who is the superintendent of the Highline Public School System in the state of Washington here, where she said, it is the promise of Highline Public Schools to know every student by strength, need, and name. Name. That is the point at which we zoom in. That is the data point at which demography becomes divorced and separated from destiny. So with that, I'd like to introduce to you all four graduates of our Big Picture Learning Network by name. Please meet Owen. In middle school, Owen was failing many of his classes and doing the worst in the sciences, which his teacher suspected was because he had no interest in the sciences. On the contrary, Owen loved the sciences and dreamed of one day becoming an astrophysicist. He was just uninspired by the methods in which the sciences were being taught to him. Owen transferred to a big picture school where his passion for science was embraced. He was encouraged to create his own path toward learning, which led him to reaching out to others. Owen launched his own YouTube channel using an, and using an approach that blends the best of Carl Sagan, an astronomer, with the best of Neil deGrasse Tyson, an American astrophysicist. Owen took his passion for astrophysics on the road. He and a classmate whose passion is filmmaking raised funds, rented a recreation vehicle, and spent a couple of months sharing their love of the sky with students across the Big Pitch Learning Network and documenting it along the way. 
please meet Jodiana. In second grade, Jodiana learned about the Middle East in a program called Passports from Around the World. And from then on, she knew that one day she wanted to explore this region of the world. As she approached high school, Jodiana's mother encouraged her to consider attending the big picture school she herself attended almost 20 years earlier, knowing that the school culture would both embrace and empower Jodiana's lifelong passion for learning about geography and globalism. Jodiana spent her junior year living out her dream as an exchange student in Jordan and returned to the state sharing what she's learned with their larger community. And that community included her friends, her family, but it also included local politicians. Jodiana has since been featured in People Magazine and has aspirations to one day become Secretary of State here in the US. Please meet Kai. Now Kai has a passion for animation and filmmaking. And like most big picture students, he sought an internship that would allow him to explore those passions. He joined the team at the Seattle Channel, which is a local cable channel that was working on a feature about Frank Nishimura, a Japanese American World War II veteran. Now the feature was part of the cable network's community stories and it was well received. And it was so well received that in fact, that production team, including Kai, won an Emmy Award that was given to them by the National Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences. And finally, meet Nassim. Nassim's passion is public speaking. And he makes no argument and no apologies about his desire to one day be president of the United States. And he grabs the microphone whenever the opportunity presents itself. And he did have such an opportunity when Nassim's Big Picture School was invited to be part of a program that allows students in cities where the play Hamilton is being performed to see the musical for free. So this is usually followed by a discussion designed to help students better understand the intersection between history, politics, and the performing arts. And one student from each school is invited to take the stage to perform. Of course, naturally, Nassim was selected as a representative from his school by his peers. And this young man made such an impression that he was then invited to be among a small handful of students who got to meet with and learn from Hamilton creator, Lynn manuel Miranda. Now we call all of these examples at Big Picture as student-driven, relationship-powered, real-world learning. And we consider them all proof points that a young person's demography does not have to equal destiny. Now, demography only equals destiny if we treat and teach young people as though they're a mass and not pay attention to their beautiful individual aspirations, gifts, and hopes. So I'd now love to spend some time taking you through some of the details of the big picture and learning design. Now, some of this is in the form of what we'd call our distinguishers. Uh, some of it's through data, uh, but I'm also very proud and appreciative of our friends in El Departamento de Educación de Catalonia, who helped set this up, making much of this come in the form of student voice. So as part of this section, we'll be sharing portions of a conversation we've recorded between a student from the Big Picture Learning Network named Camden, who comes from the state of Washington, and a student from your schools, Maria. For us, it is a core component, if not the key component, to center students and center student experiences when we talk about our work. So let me start by situating you with some definitions. And as always, in that, I'll share another student. Please meet Damara. So Damara, like many students from the Big Picture Learning Network, found herself disengaged from her educational experience by the time she entered middle school. 
Additionally, as a student from a traditionally underserved population, Damada's educational experience was heavily focused on making sure she understood core content and lacked the depth of many schools for whom deeper learning and more learner-centered competencies are an essential focus of teaching and learning. So at Damada's Big Picture School, she is part of a small learning community made up of approximately 15 students called an advisory. Now, twice a week, students don't actually go to their school to learn. They head out to internships in a place of their interest. And as you can see, some of the Mara's advisory members also intern where she interns. Now, this idea of leaving to learn, as we've mentioned before, is a key distinguisher of the big picture learning design. The idea that learning can and as often as possible should be accomplished outside of the walls of the school and in the community. Indeed, students in big picture schools often spend as much as two days of each week, not in school, but working at and learning through in their internships. Here's a short clip that I'd like to share where we have Maria and Camden discussing internships. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, those are our learning through internships or learning through interest days. Um, and so students will go out, they'll like use in Blaze, which is what uh, Chris mentioned is like a website. And then there's a bunch of uh, internship sites. So places that other people have contacted, places people have had internships at, and then you can search it through whatever category you're interested in. Um, the way that I mostly go about finding contacts is just through networking. So I'll be like, hey, are you available to have an um, interview with me? If not, can you refer uh, me to any other contacts you have who would be interested in, you know, having an um, interview or like helping me with my project? Because most of the like senior thesis projects are you need a mentor to be able to do them so you can kind of get a professional to help you along the way. Um, and then when you have an internship, you can like have a shadow day with them, figure out if it's the right fit for you. And then they'll kind of just find a spot for you in that place to help you with your project. You can just uh, kind of volunteer and do day-to-day -day things. What I wanted to do was helping people, whether that was through medicine or law or social work. So I love watching and hearing from our young people. And as I shared before, the, the beauty of technology is, 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 is what's bringing us all together. Um, so we're going back to Damara and speaking about her, in her internships. At her internship, Damara is working closely with and learning from a community mentor, often someone with a great deal of expertise in the area of a student's interests and passions. Now, the mentor helps Damara take much of what she's learning in her school and apply it in the real world setting. And how did Damara come to learn that this internship would be of interest to her? Well, each advisory is supported and led by an advisor who works closely with and forms personal relationships with each advisee, each student. Advisors often remain with their cohort of students for their entire high school experience. As part of the process of building this relationship, each student within an advisory works closely with his or her advisor to identify interest and personalize their learning experience. The advisor can also help the student seek out internships and mentorship opportunities in support of those interests. And this is for us is a very important part is, is that re healthy relationships with adults is an element that we think is just essential, not just in big picture schools, but in all schools. Here are Maria and Camden speaking a bit about how they're able to connect with adults in their context and their communities. I think that it depends on what the problem is because well, not a problem, but in the case that I have to explain something to my teacher that worries me, and um, sometimes I would say it in front of the class because I feel okay with saying it, but I think that sometimes it's great to have a teacher to 
say, hey, can I talk to you a moment and explain him because or her because I think that they wouldn't judge me in any way. And sometimes I think it's better to only say to them. Um, but well, I think that in advisory, we could like let some time or even if we have some schedule done for that day in advisory, we could say like, okay, we have to talk about a problem or a thing that worries us. And um, could we change what we are going to do today to talk about that and do it with the whole class? Because I think that sometimes we have the same problems as other people in our class and we don't really know it. I think Big Picture does this kind of well because we are with our advisors for four years. Um, if you like start off freshman year, then you'll be with your like with your teacher for four years. Um, and so you're able to really build connection with your advisor. You're able to like kind of go to them when you have problems, whether that's like educational, because they'll hold you accountable to them and then also like assist you along the way with resources. Um, like, I think right now we have a lot of staff like who is very empathetic to their students, like specific, you know, it is a one student at a time based model. And so it is like two things where it's like, you, you know, you create your own learning and you get to like understand what you want to do when all of it is based around that. But also it's like one student at a time because you get to like understand what this one specific student needs. So for us, all of this adds up to a design where in which learners are actively invested in their learning where they're challenged to pursue their interests by a supportive community of educators, professionals, and as you can see here, family members, in which the student is truly at the center of his or her own learning. But for now, let's take a deeper dive into how the big picture learning design works. So here are the specific elements, more specific elements that allow us to really talk about how we do this and what we call the elements of our design. We also heard from Damara and have served her well and thousands of others to thrive in schools like ours. This is what we might call our secret sauce. La nuestra salsa especial. Um, and the first one would be the importance of paying attention to the whole student. And for us, it's just important that we just start there. Let's talk about the student's interests their passions, experiences, challenges, and their community, and their family. For us, knowing all of these things gives us a different entry point to working with our young people. It's important to let students lean into their curiosities in schools. And fortunately, in their conversation, a little bit about curiosity came up as Maria and Camden were spending some time together. We'll hear from them. So I have a lot of like, uh, I'm slowly getting into post high school readiness. Like I understand, or I'm trying to come up with lists of, you know, where I wanna go to college. I have, I'm thinking about it financially. I'm thinking about it like, what specifically do I want to learn? You know, if I wanna go into social work, then I, you know, I can go and get my, degree in social work, um, you know, if that's not the right fit for me, then like maybe I could do this specific thing. So I have a lot of like ideas of what I want to do. And I think because of big picture, um, I have an understanding of the way that I learn, um, like what I can do to keep myself accountable. Um, I have like this, you know, this idea of like, okay, you know, like I am the one who's in control of my learning and my work, you know, the only thing that is standing between me and graduation or me and, you know, like doing the change that I want to do is myself. Do you think that you would know like what to do in the same way if you went, if you haven't, if you hadn't changed to big picture schools, like, do you think that you wouldn't know what to do if you were in your last high school? 
Yeah, I definitely think I would not know like what I would be doing. I think, you know, like I, I had a very big shift. Like I wanted to be a paramedic and go into medicine and get certified and do all these things. And like, if I didn't go to big picture, I don't think I would have accumulated this specific interest in helping other people. I learned that school. And I think that if you learn, you're um, more curious and because you know more things and you're like, okay, if I can know this, um, I want to know why is that. And well, I think that we we work very differently, but um, at the end, it's we do the same thing. Um, the difference is that we could be differently motivated. Um, I think that big picture works more on what students want to do and normal high schools like focus more on the work that has to do to graduate. But I think that in our high school, we work a bit like different. And I think that this motivates me um, a bit more and creates more curiosity because if I have to create a project or if I want to create a project, um, I oh, see by giving me the opportunity to create something, I want to search for what to do or what options do I have, what do interest me. So I think that I will actually live more interested than before. I absolutely need to meet Maria one day, everybody. Um, very, very inspirational and very, very truthful. Um, so as we continue to talk about these, these the ingredients in the secret sauce, the second ingredient would be focusing, the importance of focusing on student strengths and not just their weaknesses, everyone. Like too often we as educators or reformers in education go into schools and automatically start diagnosing what is wrong with the school or what is wrong with the students. Um, what are the gaps in learning? Uh, where do we need to focus our improvement efforts? Instead of focusing on those so-called gaps, what we do is we focus on the strengths that we can already observe occurring in the schools and the strengths that we can observe in the students. And over time, we find that as a result, those gaps become addressed as part of the process. Or they become so diminished in comparison to the strengths that they have become just completely insignificant. Now, all of us as adults have deficits, right? And we have deficits in things we, we just don't do incredibly well, but I'm pretty sure we all also have strengths that position those deficits as secondary. We play to our strengths. We should operate as educators in the same fashion. Let's hear from our friends Camden and Maria a bit on this last clip. I think that the most similar thing to your high school that we do is PCT, because we choose everything that we do. We like propose an idea. We have to choose people. We make up everything that we want to do, which is where we are going, what we are doing, and we can base this project in anything. This year we decided to do like um, an excursion, I think it's called. And we went to the campsite and we walked for three days. Like it's not a normal project and we don't work much, but we had to make a final project and it was a video of the three days. So in that like free time project and time that we spent out of the high school, we worked in filming um, activities and then making the video. And also, I think that we worked a lot of other, I think that we worked in some subjects like maths or things like that, because we had to organize our project. We had to make statistics of how it was going to be. And we had to do everything like buy the food or organize what we were going to do every day or by the ticket train. So I think that 
by choosing ourselves what we are going to do, we're working a lot more than if the teacher made that. Uh, I forgot what specific law, but it was, you know, it has to do with, again, like their interests. And so they're like, oh, you know, I really like this. Or, you know, a person wants to do psychology. And so they're going to like write a an essay about, you know, psychology or specific diagnosis. Um, or people who are doing like art projects, you know, it'll be like, oh, my project is to do an animation about this. And so, you know, they would go and they would finish it. And so when we present our learning, it's in exhibitions. Um, and so you talk about like the, the time it took for you to do your project, what specifically you did, what did you learn? Um, and so it's very like, it, it is, um, it's very flexible. It has to do with what you wanna do. I love that Camden began uh, tapping into one of the ingredients that we'll get to in a second, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit around this third ingredient of our secret sauce that focuses on encouraging students to leave to learn. Now, we've discussed this to some extent already in reference to Damara's internship at the Boat Building Factory, but it's, it's worth touching on again, as this is such a central focus of big picture learning schools. What we know is that when students leave to learn, they and their teachers and advisors are embracing the opportunities that exist for learning outside of the school walls. And another ingredient in the secret sauce is the importance of exactly what Camden was referring to is allowing students to demonstrate their learning in different ways. Like in, it could be presentations of learning, it can be exhibitions, they can be student-led conferences, like any number of different ways, in addition to your more traditional assessments, where students can demonstrate their grasp of content. The, these rigorous assessments, which we totally believe are rigorous assessments, and, and the methods employed by us at Big Picture Schools take, a, take it a step further and show that not only have students grasped the content, they absolutely know how to apply the content. And here is the here is truly the last clip that we have of Maria and Camden speaking more deeply around assessments, which Camden teased, teed up for us. I think that my grades are like um, done all the year because it's not based on only one exam, like the final exam. It's based on all the work that we do, all the work that we do in class and like essays and homework. So I think that our grades are based on more what we do at class and what projects do we do than more than the exam. And well, I think um, that's great because you can have a bad day, you can forget what was for the exam. And sometimes people stress and don't do well in the exams. We have um, exhibitions, and so that's uh, every learning cycle will have an exhibition, and you're able to present your new learning for that exhibition. And we have like graduation requirements, and so we're normally assessed by a bunch of different aspects. That's like our learning plan, and so that talks about like your long term ver vision for your goals, like after you, you know, leave um, high school as well as like, this is the vision that I have for this learning cycle. I want to specifically talk to, you know, this person, I want to create this project, I want to have this new learning. Um, and so they'll grade you on that and they'll be like, you know, I think this is really connected to what you want to do. Just want to thank again, Maria and Camden for lending us their voices and their perspective, which we think is just so important. Um, and for everyone that helped make that happen. Um, so you heard about the elements of the secret sauce and the four ingredients. And the core element of all of this is relationships, everybody. And that's relationships between student and student, student and mentor, advisor and mentor, parent and advisor, 
and either and even big picture learning alumni and advisors. Focusing heavily on relationships is for us the life's blood of the big picture learning design. And as you'll see in a moment is what got us through this pandemic. Um, earlier, I used data to illustrate how demography does not equal destiny. Now I'm going to use data that through the big picture learning model shows that the opposite is absolutely true. Proud to share that 95% of students at our highest performing big picture learning schools, those that have fully embedded and embraced our distinguishers and the elements of the secret sauce graduate on time. I'll share that 83% of those graduates head to college each year. The overwhelming majority of them, the first in their family to do so. And they're, they've retained better than similar students from the communities they come from, sadly. This may be by and large because 78% of big picture learning students will have already entered college with some credits already under their belt and completed. In some cases, big picture learning students have graduated with, with graduated high school with a fully accredited two-year college degree. So they literally walk across their graduation stage and are handed a college diploma along with their high school diploma. And please note that Big Picture Learning doesn't stress that college has to be for all students. Students should seek and follow their own pathways. And we work with students to determine their appropriate post-secondary path. And while every student isn't expected to, 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 to attend and graduate college, we want them to know that it's their choice and not because they're not prepared. And, I've, and of those students, I just referenced 74% of students who decide that college isn't the path for them have been able to secure post-graduation employment through their big picture learning internship, thanks to, thanks to the relationships and skills they've built through those experiences. We also know based upon surveys we've conducted with the big picture learning alumni that the relationships they form with their advisors tend to persist long after graduation. And this connects totally to the importance of building social equity and social capital. And that they rate their advisors as the most helpful person to have helped them prepare for their post-secondary life. Now, we have also conducted extensive longitudinal research on the long-term impact of our work in big picture learning schools. And here are some of the findings that I'll share with you all today. And as it was stated in the longitudinal study that was conducted of big picture learning alumni by Boston College, quote, at big picture learning, the network of small student-centered schools, they do an excellent job of graduating high school students and keeping them in the post-secondary pipeline longer than their demographic peers. Now, this is all well and good. It's what many people would consider our success, but we prefer this specific finding. In the same study, it states that the big picture learning design of relationships and relevance does an outstanding job of engaging students and making them feel cared for, supported, and connected to adults. And here's one more statistic that we are incredibly proud of. During the early stages of the pandemic, big picture learning schools regularly continue to see over 90% attendance in remote advisories even when local schools in the same communities were seeing less than 40% attendees. Why? It all comes back to relationships. Relationships are the foundation on which the big picture model is built. Advisors cared about how their students and their families were, but this is the crucial thing to remember. Students also cared about their advisors. It is not unlike a family in that way, and that's not by accident. Okay, so we dove back into the big picture learning design. We dove back into the data. And I'd like to leave you now with the stories of three more people 
I am a storyteller. But I'd like to tell you the story of these three, these three people by name as final proof points that demography does not equal destiny. Let's start with the story of Anna. So a little girl named Anna is born on a beautiful Caribbean island to a 16 year old unwed mother named Miss Brown. Now Miss Brown was orphaned since the age of 10 and living completely on her own since she was 14. Now Miss Brown had no close siblings and no living family members. Ms. Brown and Anna lived from town to town on the island, stay, staying with friends and acquaintances and renting out some rooms of some pretty rundown homes in some of the most impoverished areas of the island. Anna grows up under these conditions until about the age of 12, where she then drops out of school to help her mom out with their new produce business that allows them to now maintain their one bedroom place and provide food for the two of them. Now, Ms. Brown knows the importance of an education, but she needs the help. And without it, they would be homeless and without any means to care for themselves. Fast forward four years and Anna is now 16. She has grown into a tall, statuesque, beautiful and virtuous young woman. Many of the older men in the town have their eyes set on her. She looked much older than she actually was. She never entertained any of their advances. She remained polite and continued about her business. Plus she always had Ms. Brown watching over her and she was known to be one very tough lady. 10 months later at the age of 17, Anna gives birth to a baby girl. She names her Griselda, which is old German for Christian battle. Ms. Brown is beside herself. She did not approve of this path she was on. It showed in her actions and how she treated Anna often in public. Anna grew tired of the treatment and left Miss Brown's house with Griselda and began working at a hotel in the capital city. Now, after working at the hotel for six years, Anna gets an opportunity to leave the island to work with the hotel chain in the United States, but she needs to leave Griselda with Miss Brown. She arrives in the States and meets a charming man who is from a different island. He is generous, befriends her, but is aggressive. They date for a while, but he becomes physically abusive. Anna remains in the relationship out of fear. And to shelter herself from her abusive relationship, she immerses herself into a world of books at her local library in Brooklyn, New York. She catches the attention of many in upper management as she is aware of current events. She's articulate and professional. I mean, the sister is impressive. Many decide that it is time, Anna decides that it is time for her to leave her abusive partner of three years. She moves out despite the continued threats. Griselda and Ms. Brown arrive in the States. Griselda begins public school. Ms. Brown begins working at the same hotel as Anna and things are looking good. On Christmas Eve of that year, Anna's abusive partner interrupts their holiday dinner. He enters their apartment brandishing a 25 caliber gun and proceeds to shoot Anna twice. Anna survives, although she loses sight in one eye, hearing in one ear and is permanently disfigured. And due to the cocktail of medication that she's forced to take, she develops kidney problems, lung issues, and some heart complications. And after recu recuperating and recovering for 18 months, she is hired as a personal housekeeper for one of the hotel owners. Now, Anna is convinced that due to her disfigurement that no one will ever want her. Enter Victoriano, a gentleman, or as we would say, un caballero also new to the States. He meets Anna, sees her beauty, her strength, her intelligence, and they fall immediately in love. They date, they marry, they work through two miscarriages and have a baby boy. They name him Carlos for courage. They remain happily married until this day and just celebrated 50 years of marriage this past November. 
if you're wondering. I'm absolutely the son of Ana and Victoriano Moreno. I'm also the grandson of Miss Isabel Brown, and I am the brother of Griselda. And now, although I have not lived these powerful life events personally, they are absolutely a part of who I am and serve as a reminder that every day is a gift. And we must always, always fight for those things that we believe and that the belief to be true and that we need in this life. Second story, and this is a bit of my story. I grew up in the Bronx, exactly five New York City blocks away from one of the most respected institutions of higher learning in New York City, the Rose Hill campus of Fordham University, which is in the Northwest part of the Bronx. Now, although I've never stepped foot on the Fordham University campus in my life, from my bedroom at my parents' apartment on Decatur Avenue, I had a clear view of the Fordham dormitories. And at night before going to bed, I would look at the glow coming from the campus from my bedroom window and often found myself wondering what was going on, thinking about what the dorm rooms look like, who were the students, how, were, how challenging were the classes, where were the students from? And probably the one question that would be on the mind of any you know, teenage boy uh, when he thinks about college, I wanted to know if the dorms and the dorm rooms were co-ed. Now, my high school was a 30 minute walk from my home every day. And every day I would walk by the Fordham University entrance on my way to and from school. I was your typical underachieving student athlete. I was respectful to my teachers, had a lot of friends and did as little as I could, but just enough to make sure I remained eligible to play sports all year round. And then my life changed drastically on the afternoon of Thursday, October 21st, 1993. At the age of 15, I was assaulted and robbed at gunpoint by two men on my walk home from school. Two men I did not know, standing right outside the entrance to Fordham University. I was beat up, pistol whipped, and robbed for my $89 Cincinnati Bengals starter jacket. It's an American football team. They played in the Super Bowl this past year, finally. Now, when the ordeal was over, what I should have been able to do is run onto Fordham's campuses to tell someone, but that space and place clearly communicated to me that I was not welcome. It would have felt like trespassing onto someone's private property. And quite honestly, it was just as scary for me at the time as being robbed. So I took the long run home. And to my parents' credit, Ana and Victoriano, they did everything that two law-abiding immigrant parents from the Caribbean could do. They took me to the police station to file a report. Two nondescript men that I have never seen before that would fit the description of about 2 million men in New York City, I knew quickly that there would be no justice served. I wasn't gonna get my jacket back and there would be no retribution. It was back on the same route to school the next day. Now at school where I spent somewhere close to 12 hours a day because of the number of activities and sports I was engaged in, there was no one I could talk to, no one who really knew me. And even though I was wearing, you know, you could see what had happened all over my face, the most that I got from the adults at the school was like, ouch, I'm sorry. Now, the majority of the teachers, God bless them, were incredibly well-intended middle-aged women who lived in New Jersey, who I had very little, if anything, in common with, and who were quite honestly rushing to get out of the Bronx at the end of the workday. My coaches, they listened, but offered nothing except encouragement for me to take out my anger and my frustration out in the sports, on the field, or on the courts. So there wasn't one adult that looked like me, that came from where I came from, that could, 
that could help me or took the time to help me navigate the mix of emotions I was struggling with, the embarrassment, the anger, and the fear that this 15 year old needed someone to reassure him that despite how I was feeling that I was going to be okay because they were able to be okay. I needed my own Superman, Superwoman, but they never came. But even as important as it was for me to have been able to connect with someone that looked like me, beyond that, what I really needed was to have someone in my school who would be my advocate, who would have realized that I needed a chance to address what had just happened before I could move on. Someone who would have appreciated and known that as Tupac, the famous artist and rapper and poet Tupac shared, that despite all the damaged petals I may have had, that a rose can grow in the concrete. I know if I had been one of the students at Fordham that before being thrown back into class and expected to perform, there would have been counselor meetings, safety plans, discussions, my parents would have been brought in, everything, but not for 15 year old Carlos Moreno. Now, one of the rules when you engage in innovative work is to solve a problem that one is passionate about. I am incredibly passionate about solving the problem of inequality of opportunity that many of our young people face in schools. Along the way in my journey, I've met some tremendous people and adults that have supported me to be where I am. And my commitment continues to be to leave this world in a much better state for future generations. And speaking of future generations, the last story is about a young girl, my baby. Her name is Isabella, but she prefers to be called Bella because it's much cooler. Now, this is a little girl that was born nearly four months early at 24 weeks and weighing a mere one pound and 14 ounces. And here's something I never would have expected as a young man growing up in the boogie down Bronx. I enjoy standing by a river on a freezing fall afternoon, knowing that for a few minutes, a few moments, I have an opportunity to watch my daughter Isabella ex excel at her craft, rowing. She is a rower. Now, I can't remember the exact moment she came home to tell us that she wanted to try rowing, but I remembered every hot chocolate, every close finish, and every championship since. And I'll truly remember the pride that swelled up when she started receiving interest from top flight universities, inviting her to consider joining their prestigious college programs. But to be completely honest with you all, my instinct has been to pull back from projecting this pride too broadly. There's a part of me that worries that my family and I will be perceived as snobbish or simply in our collective you know, in our collective reach for excellence, particularly given that Bella's interest, not to mention her God-given athletic ability, has steered her toward a sport that itself is often accurately perceived as elitist. But I have to fight those urges and those instincts for this purpose. And I really hope that we all would hear this and agree. We should never apologize for being proud of our children. We should never stand in the way of their interests and passions. And we should always welcome the helping hand of others who recognize and wish to reward those skills, reward those interests and passions. I have been singing Isabella's praises, sorry, Bella, Bella's praises for as long as she's been alive and to anyone who will listen. And this is a natural part of parenting, a natural part of encouraging and validating her own feelings of self-worth and accomplishment, but there's a new level of value that comes from being explicitly chosen. The sheer impact of receiving a telephone call or a text from a world-renowned rowing coach and university just has yeah. been astonishing to watch. Now for Bella, it's been, the impact has pushed to work harder and validate the work she's put in so far. Every young person is trying to find out how they can matter and make their way in the world. They are trying to establish their stance. 
the way that the world sees them and the way that they see the world. Now, for some, it will be through sports or the arts. For others, it will be through craft skills or academic competence. Now, I believe our big picture learning schools are driven by this quest. Provide opportunities for all young people to pursue individual interests and to turn those interests into a lifetime of learning. Every child would say that they are valued, that they matter, and that they feel supported in pursuing their interests and developing their talents. Neither the opportunities nor the outcomes will be the same for all students, but all will feel that their accomplishments are recognized and values, valued. They will and they deserve to know that they matter. So I want to thank you all for inviting me here today. I hope that you found some inspiration in the stories or even in the conversations between students from our respective worlds. But it's not just about inspiration, it's about what I call a breakthrough. And as we know, inequities can take many forms and can be institutionalized on many levels, personally, school-wide, community-wide, or even country-wide. And as educators and leaders, please remember to follow your own path when reflecting on what you've heard, but with one goal in mind always, everyone, breaking through. And how do we break through as leaders, as individuals trying to actualize our true selves? Mainly, we just cannot give up. We have to be present. We have to lean into discomfort. We must remain open, always seek inspiration, and we ask for help. And we have to always set forth. And when we talk about setting forth, we set forth on a journey that looks something like these mentioned in our final video clip. Thank you very much, Professor Carlos Moreno. You've been very inspiring. This has been a wonderful presentation. Your witnessing and storytelling is incredibly powerful. And so is your commitment to success of all students. I'd like to highlight the fact that we've come to realize that your big picture learning system sets the right conditions for all students to do three things. First, commit to their learning. Um, second, learn deeply. And third, find ways to demonstrate what they've learned. And there are as many ways as students in your classrooms. In other words, you have maximum flexibility in terms of demonstrating learning. This is essential because it really sets the basis for everyone's success. Mireya is now looking for the questions that were raised in the chat. But you know, before I thank you for this wonderful conversation that we have experienced, I would like to highlight your way of envisaging excellence as a contribution. In other words, we can all play a role because we can all contribute. And this contribution is what commits us to excellence. If the context makes it possible, so much more so. I have a question about teachers because we've talked a lot about students and their voice and their choices today. But we know that highly performing systems and by performance, we mean promoting deep learning. Highly performing systems use teacher training as a driver of education, of, of, of learning and, 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 and quality. So how does big picture learning handle this professional development and working together to improve together? Yeah, th thank you, Vergonia, for the question. Um, I, I would say that one of the, the beautiful components and structures within the big picture design in schools is how closely the adults and educators work together 
to serve their students. And that ranges from supporting each other across content, sharing lessons, and even with this, you know, the project-based design, right? Where you have projects that incorporate a variety of different content areas and disciplines is it's not, it's they, you know, they collaborate and co-teach and co-lead and co-plan in really rich ways that I think you don't, sadly, you don't find as often in your more conventional schools. So there is an emphasis on teacher professional development. It is not, it is not unusual to find when folks come, you know, from a more traditional or conventional school or school system to teach at a big picture school, to be really surprised by the amount of professional development and support that is provided. And, and, I, and I'm completely biased, but I'd say it's quality. Um, for a, a, a real life example I'll provide is uh, this past week, I, I met with my old advisory. I'm a former advisor myself and teacher. And one of, um, one of my former students taught at a big picture school. Right. And she loved the experience. She was great. And then she wanted to try and learn how to I mean, she wanted she wanted to teach Spanish. Right. So she tried to go to another tra traditional school where she's currently at to teach her, you know, what she was trained for. And, you know, I won't say that she's miserable. Right. She loves it because she's able to build connections. But she's referenced specifically that the professional development that she receives at this school is is definitely it's not even remotely close to the quality of professional development that she received at, as a big picture advisor. Um, so I'm hoping that, that that answers some of it. So I think that's that's a little bit around like this emphasis around, you know, again, we have to support. It is a very difficult job. I can speak from experience. It is very challenging. Um, and we have to absolutely support our, our, our teachers and our educators to do the very best that they can with this design. Thank you very much, Carlos. I think everybody has been carefully listening, the whole presentation, the whole address, because uh, more questions are coming on stream. Shall we put the video which you wish to show us? And uh, hopefully some more questions will come in and I'll re read the questions out to you. So let's uh, look at the video. Be selfless to yourself, recognizing you are your chief steward. Do the work, acquire knowledge, expand your giving, your influence, and your compassion. Identify your trusted circle, create safe spaces, be fully vulnerable, and allow yourself to feel with abandon and focus on impact. Do the little things with intent. The breakthrough will definitely follow. As I said earlier, we have some questions ready to ask now. One question is this, how do you ensure quality and high standards in developing skills? We could do just uh, just take each question in turn and then answer it. So, how do we ensure quality and high standards in developing skills? Yeah, I appreciate the question because ultimately, we're as educators, we are um, employed by systems and school systems, so we are subject to certain levels of of expectations. Um, as I shared, a lot of the most of our schools, if not all, at some point have to take this, you know, your more traditional testing and examinations, right? That we, we, we're not, we, there's no escaping that. So that's the reality. So in a traditional sense, our schools are still able to excel with distinction and hit those marks. So if you're looking for a more traditional, um, you know, uh, kind of marker, as to how we're doing, big picture schools hit those traditional marks. Where we go beyond that is the exhibitions and where students are able to articulate and present their learning in very professional ways. 
And it's not just a, like, here, look at what I did. It's an opportunity for them to talk about what they learned and also field questions and defend their work. There's something about defending your work because you have this pride in what you did and having adults and other students and community members really ask, you know, this is not just like, oh, we're here to make you feel good. No, this is an opportunity for you to really talk deeply about what you've learned and show us what you learned. And then as part of that experience is also an opportunity to take suggestions on how you can go deeper in your work. How, okay, what's the next level? Okay, you've reached this part. Now you need to step it into this next realm, right? You need to expand your learning, right? Whether it's you know across content areas. So, you know, and we hold ourselves to pretty high as a, I would say as a network is a pretty high standard. Yes, we're big on relationships, but one of the things I often tell people that I don't want the, them to confuse when I say that we're very, that relationships are super important. This is not soft, right? This is not soft. Um, this is incredibly rigorous, right? And when you have young people who love and are interested in what they're doing, they will surpass our own expectations. Muchas gracias. Mira, Thank you very much. There's another question that may allow you to go deeper into this. It's linked to the previous question, to, to what you just said. It's actually something that came up at the start. And the question is this, would the key be to think of a higher aim uh, a future aim rather than achieving short-term objectives. Let me repeat that. Is the key to think of a higher aim looking into the future rather to focus on achieving short-term uh, learning objectives? I think it's very linked to what you just said, but maybe you can go deeper into that. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, we're yes. definitely, you know, Everything that we we try to have young people experience in our schools, we want it to be real, right? We want it to be grounded in the real world and not just because I'm asking you to do this because I as a teacher or the broader system is saying, you just have to do it because there's, I can't, I can't communicate the value to you as a person. It is absolutely about long-term goals, right? But also in knowing that there's those long-term goals, you're incrementally hitting on those short-term goals that are necessary, right? So there's the scaffolding as all of us as educators, um, there's scaffolding to build up to that. Yes, we, like the focus isn't always just, let's start with what's in front of you right now. What's your long-term vision? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? What are you curious about? What are the experiences that you need to have? And let's start there. And then we build towards those. So I appreciate that, that question, whoever asked it and clarification. Then there are some other questions that are of a more technical nature and they've come up because, of course, our education system in Catalonia is very different from the system you have in the States. So we have the following questions about the advisor. You know, what kind of person is an advisor? Are they just another teacher? Are they psychologists? What kind of professional background do they have? And what kind of background and training do the teachers have? What kind of resources do you have? Do the teachers, are the teachers in your schools volunteers? In other words, do they know where they're, what they're getting into and, and what the school uh, works like? And another question out of curiosity is, what is your uh, student-teacher ratio? So it's all that. They're great, and I love it because it, it, it shows just kind of folks thinking about trying to envision what this looks like. So I appreciate the specificity of those questions. Um, the, the staff, is, in particular, let's start with the advisors. They are licensed teachers within the school, right? So they have a specialty in, usually in a content area, but they're all licensed teachers and faculty of the school, employees of the school. Um, we do. With that said, there are also, we encourage volunteers, right, to come and, and support learning in different ways from the broader community, right? Of course, there's always, a, you know, we have to be safe when we talk about young people, right? So we take all the measures necessary to ensure that our young people are safe. Um, 
but yes, our goal is to, you know, is to, if someone has a passion and they have a talent and they are skilled in something and it matches with the student's interest, it could be one-on-one, -on -one, it could be an opportunity for them to, even in the younger grades, to read to young people, right? Whatever it is, right? They allow for it to, to also begin breaking down this stigma or this uneasiness of like connecting with adults is, is one that we encourage. The other thing is, it's a great, I think it's a fabulous question around are the staff psychologists? Because I would say I, as an advisor, I definitely do not have a psychology degree. I am not a social worker, but I do sometimes believe I have an honorary um, master's in social work because of the number of conversations that I've had with young people over the years. And we do have social work staff in our schools, right? Who support the you know advisors and others on how to manage and have those conversations with young people, right? I'm, you know, so, and also folks who are professionally trained, if when students elevate something to a level that is above my expertise. So I can always refer them to, to, to someone on staff. And if, and if it's beyond that, they can make a referral to, to an outside organization. I mean, the, the, our students' mental health and, and, and just well being is super critical for them to be able to to thrive before we can talk about learning. Perfect, Adolf. Muchas gracias. Uh, Thank you fa... very much. You just mentioned the mental health of your students. We also have a few questions about how you uh, bond with your students, how you develop a connection with them. So a technical question, are there regular meetings with a mentor, advisor, family, and so forth? How are these relationships managed? And also, how do you build a relationship or build a bond when the student, the, the student is putting up a barrier to such a relationship? Uh, it, it absolutely happens. And for us, it's around not forcing you can't force the relationship, right? Um, I'll give an example. I had this young woman in my advisory. Her name was Priscilla. Um, and while I was building what I felt were really great and open relationships with a number of other students, with Priscilla, and, and with them, it was happening really quickly. With Priscilla, it took a little bit more time because of who she was and who her personality was. So, and eventually we got to that place, but it was just, you know, I think as long as you operate with the, the sense of mutual respect, it's okay that the relationships are, you know, she wasn't as forthcoming and open as other students. Um, so so there, there, there's that piece. And then, so in terms of the linkage between all the, all the different dimensions of the school, um, I mentioned the exhibition, right? The presentations of learning that happens four times a year. And at the conclusion of each exhibition, there's what we call a learning plan meeting. So that is an opportunity for the advisor, the student and the parent to sit down, reflect on the past quarter, reflect on the exhibition and the presentation and also make plans for the upcoming, the upcoming year. Now that is by no means the only time when that happens. Sometimes the meetings need to happen a little bit more frequently. Um, it also within our structure is not unusual for an advisor to travel to a parent's and a student's home and meet with them there, to, which also clearly communicates a very different type of relationship. Not that you have to come to school and we meet here. No, I, if you're open to it and you're, you're okay with it, I'm happy to come to your home. We can sit down and talk there. Um, most teachers and most systems do not do that. Um, and with regard to the mentors, which are the professionals at the internship sites where the students are are there you know, twice a week in, in, in most cases. The goal of an advisor is to be able to visit and meet with the mentor at least once a month, maybe once to four to six weeks to get an update on what's happening, um, to kind of talk about the project that they're completing. And we have developed an incredible platform, a digital platform that is available, I think worldwide at this point called Emblaze that helps managing the communication of the internships much more easily than perhaps than you know it was when I <laughs> when I was an advisor a long long time ago. Um, so there are a lot of structures and technical pieces that are in place that we've continued to build on and have evolved for us over the years. 
Great, I think we're all really into this and picking up a lot of ideas. Another question is, how do you do your diagnosis to identify the students' strengths and uh, whether what they've identified is truly one of their strengths? Uh, the short answer is that they are, right? So the, the, the thing is that because of the the involvement of the young person in their own learning, we want the young person to understand students, to understand their learning style, be aware of their strengths. And, and also how to, in some ways, compensate for those, right, when necessary. So there's a lot of transparency. You know, I, I as a former student, as all of us as adults, I would wonder how many of us in our formal schooling got a chance to see the records that all the teachers got to see. The students, students can see those, right? They're aware of it. Some of them have learning differences and challenges. The goal is for them to learn what it is that you know, their challenges are so they know how to manage that. Why is it that they're, you know, they're getting, they, they, they benefit from more one-on-one -on -one support, right? Why, you know, certain, certain, certain things because of perhaps of how they think and how they process might be slightly different than others, right? And not because that's a bad thing, it's just different. And we all have those differences. Um, those differences, I think in our schools are just celebrated. Right, they're, they're, they're not like stigmas, they're not like, oh, this is bad, right? It's more like we all have those differences and some show up to, you know, in different ways than others. Another question has come up after hearing you. So how do we uh, abolish this self-perception that we don't deserve something or that we're not able and that particularly impacts certain uh, students that are from more underprivileged backgrounds? How do you get rid of that? That's a fabulous question because it's, it's, a very, it's very real and we know it happens and there's this um, thing that we often call imposter syndrome that I even often have to talk to my daughter about, right? When she says, oh my gosh, and then why me, not me? I'm like, absolutely you, right? Why not you? You deserve this. You're talented. You're, and and, and it's, sometimes it's beyond words, right? You have to show it. You have to put them in that position, right? Encourage them. And what I've seen is quick and early success, right? When someone experiences success, and sometimes it could be the slightest success, changes can start changing a young person's perception of themselves and perhaps how they've seen each other, right? Positive reinforcement is so critical, right? Um, and usually the work is on the part of the adults. We're the ones that have to do the work, right? We're the ones that have to do the work because oftentimes we're projecting to young people like that they don't deserve this or they're not good enough, right? So we should check ourselves and how we communicate with young people around this, right? Because that's why they see themselves at that, as that. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Here are some more questions you don't have to answer, but I'm sure you'll be happy about. One is actually a comment thanking you for those personal stories that you've shared with us that have surely led a lot of people to a lot of deep thinking during your uh, presentation, but will will which people will continue uh, mulling upon afterwards. And one question a lot of people have asked was whether we would be recording today's presentation. So clearly people definitely want to watch this over and over again. I'll now hand over to Begonia, who has questions of her own, I know, and so she can ask them herself. Thank you, Mireya. Rather than a question, there's something I just want to add, something I was thinking of when you, Carlos, were sharing your personal experience of how you perceived the university and the way you walked past, past that university on a daily basis, you know, with an emphasis on, uh, you know, your fear and being held up and the fact that you felt that you didn't belong there and you couldn't go in. This place, this place that you walked past daily, so close to your own home, 
remind me, reminded me of something that Canetti, Elias Canetti, the Nobel Prize in Literature, who has a book of aphorisms. It's a wonderful book. And one of my favorite aphorisms in Elias Canetti's book is the following, and I'll read it, I'll, I'll recite it slowly. Your story reminded me of this quote, and it's the following. Everywhere, two steps away from your daily paths, there is another air that awaits you doubting. And what came to mind was that what big picture learning makes possible is for all of your students to find this other air that awaits you doubting. Thank you for that, Begonia. A pleasure. I'll hand back to you, Mireya. Well, we could uh, just keep talking to Professor Moreno and keep asking him questions, if we could, but we will shortly be publishing an interview with him, and I'm sure we will continue to enjoy reading about the ideas in big picture learning. Today's questions and comments show that education leaders and teachers are committed to the quality of the system. The schools that are part of the Learning in the School that Learns group, which Carlos met up with when we started preparing today's webinar, uh, these schools have already taken one important step forward in favor of equality. They applied to have projects with opportunities for success to support students. P-O-E-F-A is the well-known acronym here. There's something I'd like to highlight, too, about the conversation between Camden and Maria when they said that they would be finishing school with more curiosity than when they started. This is something I want to highlight because the schools that are part of this group are also using the spiral of inquiry to improve their students' learning outcomes. And the idea that all students should finish school with more curiosity than when they started out is one of the key elements of their inquiry. It's something that we all share in our network. Special thanks should also go to the teachers at Pla Marseille High School who facilitated Maria Rue's conversation with Camden Torres. I'm talking about the principal, Alex Salleras, the education coordinator, Gemma Alveza, and teachers, Maria Ferreras and Paula Perez. Our thanks also go to our colleagues in the education service, especially Yolanda Gonzalez, who, as Carlos knows, took part in the whole preparation process leading up to this webinar. And our thanks also go to Chris Jackson, head of communication at uh, Big Picture Learning, whom we haven't seen on screen, but who has been there behind the scenes and supporting the whole process. Lastly, thank you, Carlos Moreno, for agreeing to this webinar. And thank you to all of you who registered and participated as we've already told you, in the chat, this webinar will be available in English and in Catalan in the uh, relevant stream in the playlist called Learning in the School that Learns. And that's it from me. Nothing else to add. Good afternoon, good evening, and uh, good day to you in the States. Thank you very much, and thank you, all of you. It's been a pleasure, and it's been an honor. The honor was mine. I look forward to future conversations. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And a good afternoon to all.